Hi, Holly. Musk, you're Pardon. in. Pardon me. Oh, you're in New York, aren't you? Good evening. Hi, welcome to the class. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mushki. Um, this I is not the second daughter. Welcome, Mushki. Hi. Hi. Mushki, welcome. <laughs> I recognize some faces. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm taking over my mother-in-law this week since she's still in New York from um, my nephew, her grandson's bar mitzvah, um, as well as it's the conference of all the Chabad emissaries worldwide is happening this week. It's for the men this week, but my mother-in-law stayed with my father-in-law. Um, today we're going to be discussing this week's Parsha, this week's Torah reading, which is Chai Sarah. It's called The Life of Sarah. And the simple question that our sages all ask is, how come this Parsha, which actually speaks of Sarah's passing and Sarah's burial, um, how come it's called the life of Sarah? Because seemingly that 
that uh, is the direct opposite of Sarah's life. It's the time when Sarah's life ended. Um, and we learn a powerful lesson from this, which is that um, we're taught that Sarah lived by such strong values and her life was so alive and so strong for everything that she stood for and all the good things that she did, that even after she passed on, um, her life continued in the fact that all the influence that she had on her family and her environment, um, they lasted, they continued, and her life truly lived on through that. Um, and there's three examples for this in this week's Torah reading. Um, the first one is Avram finding a wife for Yitzchak. That happens in this week's Torah reading. Um, he sends his uh, servant, Eliezer, to go look for a wife. And he does find Rivka through a lot of divine providence. Hashem orchestrates that he should find the right one. And this is Rivka. And this was something that Sarah throughout her whole life was um, constantly yearning for and encouraging and making sure that this would happen, that Yitzchak would find the right wife, be able to build a family and continue on um, the Jewish generations. As we know, all the Jewish people come from Yitzchak. Um, so that's... Abraham and then Yitzchak. Um, so she really wanted to make sure that this would happen, the continued continuity of the Jewish people would be fulfilled. And we see right after she passed away um, is when Yitzchak is able to find his wife Rivka because Abraham made it his mission to really make sure that he would fulfill Sarah's mission, was, which is to make sure that Yitzchak would find the right wife to be able to continue leading and continuing the Jewish chain. Um, so that was one event that showed how Sarah's life continued even after her passing. And another event that happened was um, Sarah's burial. Sarah was the first one to be buried um, in a piece of land of Israel that was bought by a Jew. So Abraham bought Ma'ara Samachpela, that's where all the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried now. Um, but then it was the first piece of land that was purchased by a Jew that was recognized by all the non-Jewish nations. They all, you know, agreed and recognized that this was a plot of land that Abraham bought. And it was Sarah who had the merit to be the first one from all our patriarchs or matriarchs. She was the first one to be buried there. And this teaches us that Sarah throughout her life had a strong belief and trust and faith in God um, and believed that God will ultimately give the whole land of Israel to the Jewish people um, as God promised to Abraham that the Jewish land, that the Jewish land is Israel and the land of Israel belongs to us. And therefore, we see right after she passed away, um, Abraham was able to bury her in a, the land of Israel in a part that was purchased by a Jew. And it was it was considered to be our possession in the eyes of all the non-Jewish nations around at that time. So that's something very powerful. Um, and I don't remember the exact think of it later well I guess it's the daughters of Tzalafchad we've seen another part of Torah that um, it was the woman throughout our history that actually has had that strong um, you know belief and trust and passion for the land of Israel more than the men um, that they that we throughout the generations have really believed that the land of Israel is ours and believe that God will ultimately fulfill the promise when the whole land of Israel will belong to the Jewish people, and that's going to be in the time of Mashiach, when Mashiach comes, we'll all return to the Holy Land. Um, so that was something else that we learned from Sarah. And a third event in this week's Parsha, um, where we, yes, I mean, Eugenia, um, where we see how Sarah's life continued even after her passing was in the fact that Abraham gave all of his possessions. After Yitzchak got married, he gave everything that he had to Yitzchak. And this as well was something that Sarah throughout her life um, really wanted and was really um, passionate about, that everything that Abram has should go to Yitzchak and not Yishmael. Um, we know Yitzchak was um, Sarah's actual child. It was Sarah and Abraham's child together. And Yishmael was Abraham's child that he had with Sarah's maidservant Hagar. Hagar. So it wasn't Sarah's son. It was just Abraham's son. And um, we're told that Yishmael is actually the father of the non-Jewish nations, more specifically, um, the father of, of the Arabs. It's hard to track the exact lineage. Like, I don't know if we 
you know, because all the nations really intermarried at a certain point. So, but uh, traditionally, Yishmael is the father of the Arabs. And Sarah said that, you know, although Abraham felt a strong connection to both his sons, Yitzchak and Yishmael, because they were both his sons, Sarah said it's going to be Yitzchak who's going to be the father of the Jewish people. And um, he deserves to be the one to get everything from Abraham. And ultimately, Abraham listened to her and gave all his possessions to Yitzchak, um, which shows again how the power of Sarah um, in her life, she was, and it's, these are three examples that are in this week's Parsha, but it's really um, everything Sarah stood for, her belief in Hashem and her belief in doing acts of goodness and kindness. We spoke last week, whoever was on last week's class, I gave it as well, um, about how Abraham and Sarah epitomized the idea of kindness. Um, towards all people, because really there was no Jewish people then. So they would be actually spreading the word of God to all Jewish people that would pass by their home. They would invite them into their tent. They would serve them food and really treat them with utmost respect and love. And people from all over would come to Sarah and Abraham's tent to receive advice, guidance, um, physical and spiritual help. So it's really all these things um, the belief and trust in God, the belief in spreading God to everyone and teaching everybody about God, um, as well as doing acts of goodness and kindness um, for everybody physically and spiritually. This was something that Sarah lived with so strongly that her influence extended even after her lifetime. And that's why this week's Parsha is called the life of Sarah, showing how even after her passing, her life truly lived on and how each of us can learn from that, obviously, in the sense that living life to our fullest, using every day of our lives to, you know, stand for what we believe in, um, add more in our Judaism, add more in acts of goodness and kindness and our trust in Hashem. And through strengthening ourselves and strengthening um, our purpose for what we're here, um, which is to be connected to Hashem, to do the Torah mitzvah and to spread godliness to everyone around us. Um, that's how really, um, even after a person's lifetime, their life continues and their influence continues to spread uh, many years later to their children, to the generations, to the grandchildren, um, whoever is up to that point in life. And um, that's something really powerful and um, special that we learned from Sarah. And that was the first thing that uh, the first topic of today's um, feminine conversation. The second thing, the second lesson we learn um, is also in this week's Torah reading. It's from Abraham. We're told um, in one of the psukim, it says, one of the verses, that Abraham was old and advanced in years. So the sages have a question on this, which is, why the repetition? Why, why are we saying Abraham was old and advanced in years? It would seem enough to say either he was old or he was advanced in years. And this is particularly true since we know that every word and even every letter in the Torah um, is not in vain and has a purpose and has um, extreme significance. And um, there's many, many, many commentaries and um, explanations on different words in Torah that seem to be extra, different letters in Torah that seem to be extra, um, which really shows that the Torah is something that was given to us by God. And every single part of Torah is, is has a lesson for us and has meaning for us of how we should live our lives um, every day nowadays life um, and forever, the Torah is eternal. So the question again is, how come in this week's Torah portion, it says Abraham was old and he was advanced in years, why both? Um, so there's two explanations given, it could be there's more, but two that I saw. Um, one is that Torah wants to emphasize the fact that there could be people who are old um, in age, meaning they're advanced in years, nevertheless, they're uh, their accomplishments, let's say, or their maturity or their um, intelligence or all those stuff, their qualities, haven't grown um, together with their age. Someone could be advanced in, in years, but still be behind in um, their growth. Um, versus Avraham, the Torah wants to emphasize and teach us that Avraham is the ultimate example of being um, advancing in his years together with advancing spiritually and advancing um, in all fronts. Abraham was someone who um, strived to use every single one of his days to the fullest, to the maximum. And also, this also connects to last week's um, Torah reading, last week's class that I gave, which is really nice to keep seeing how, um, you know, every 
Torah reading, every Parsha really connects. Um, last, I already forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, that last week we spoke about how Abraham was circumcised at 99 years old. And we learned a powerful message from that because um, obviously we know, you have a question? Oh. Obviously we know that um, Abraham, like, Physically, at 99 years old, um, that's very hard to undergo a circumcision. Um, obviously, the person's body is much more weak and frail at 99. Um, we last week, that besides for the fact that it was physically harder to undergo a circumcision at 99, the real um, amazingness, um, I don't know if that's a word, of uh, the fact that Abraham got the circumcision at 99 was because it showed how Abraham wanted to continue advancing in his spirituality and continuing to get closer to God and do more Torah mitzvah, even though he was 99 um, and he went through so much of his life already, he wasn't complacent. He wasn't, you know, satisfied. He didn't say, you know, 99 already. I did a lot of good things in my life. You know, I think it's time to you know, take more of a relaxed uh, state, uh, but rather Abraham every day, no matter how old he was, he continued to fulfill his days to the fullest and continue to accomplish more and more. Um, and that's basically um, the title of the class, which was living life to its fullest. What we learned from Abraham, how Torah is teaching us he was not only old, he was also advanced in his years. With every, with every year that he grow, grew older, he would advance in his um, connection to Hashem, advance in his Torah mitzvot, and keep growing and keep going. And obviously, it's a, a self-explanatory lesson to all of us. We're all children of Abraham. We all are Abraham's descendants, which means that we are given the strength and the ability and the capability to follow in Abraham's footsteps. By mere, by mere fact that we're descendants of Abraham, that means we all... Our souls are all connected to Abraham and we're able to actually tap into our soul and get the same strength that Abraham had to continue growing in his spirituality and never giving up, never um, becoming satisfied um, of where he was in life, but rather always looking to see how can I do better? How can I become you know, better towards God, towards other people, um, towards spreading godliness and making the world um, a better and a more good and godly place. Um, so that was the second point of today's class. And the final point, um, another thing that we learned in today's, um, in this week's, not today, sorry, this week's Torah reading is the marriage of Yitzchak and Rivka, like I mentioned before. Um, and actually we're told that the fact that Torah um, designates 67 verses I believe I got the right number to talk about Yitzchak and Rivka's uh, marriage, how they met and the whole story about Eliezer going to find a wife and really elaborate on all the details. Um, the fact that 67 sukkim, 67 verses were, were mentioned in the Torah shows that this is a very significant event. This is something that's a very important event that happened in the Torah, which is Yitzchak and Rivka getting married. And the reason for that is, is because Yitzchak and Rivka were the first Jewish marriage to happen in the Torah um, after Adam and Chava, which Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, they were the first uh, Jews, quote unquote, to get married. But that was orchestrated by God. God, you know, created the man, created the woman. I mean, created them as one, which actually connects to what I'm going to say soon. Originally, God created one person, the male and the female connected, and then um, after Hashem separated Adam and Eve into a separate male, but really they were one being and one body to begin with, and then God separated them um, in order really to reunite again, but just to have that separateness to then reunite. So although Adam and Eve are really the first Jewish couple to get married, it was God who created both of them and gave them to each other. So why Yitzchak and Rivka's marriage is so special is because they were the first Jewish marriage in Torah that they, you know, had to happen through the natural course, so to say, you know, Eliezer was the matchmaker, Eliezer had to go and look for Yitzchak's wife, it didn't just happen like Adam and Eve that God just gave Eve to Adam and it was right there, um, it had to actually go through nature, it was the first Jewish marriage that the human effort was um, 
was needed and involved. So because of that, we actually learn some powerful lessons from Yitzhak and Rufka and from their marriage. And one of the things that we learn from is very interesting. Um, we're told that Rufka receives tons and tons of, of gifts and jewelry and a huge dowry um, from Abraham for marrying Yitzhak. But amongst all of those stuff, we're told that Yitzhak gave Rifka a golden ring that was the weight, I believe, of half or the value of half a shekel. So shekel is it's still the same. You know, if you go to Israel, it's still a shekel. And in the Torah as well, it's, that was the currency in those days. It was a shekel. So half a shekel was the same weight or value as the golden ring that um, Yitzhak gave Rifka. And our sages ask, what's the significance of the half a shekel? Why did he give Rifka a ring with that, with that weight, with that uh, equivalence in value? And it's very interesting because our sages say that the fact that uh, the ring was half a shekel actually alludes to something that, that would happen in the future. Um, so not something in this, in this week's Torah reading, but something later on that would happen, which is when the Jewish people were in the desert and they, um, it was time to build the Mishkan, which was the home for Hashem before the Bet was was built, before the the permanent place for Hashem was built, the Bet Um, There was a temporary um, uh, home and dwelling um, that the Jewish people would make while they were in the desert. And for this Mishkan, Hashem instructed all the Jews that every Jewish people needs to give every Jewish person needs to give half a shekel towards the building of this Mishkan. And our sages connect the two and they said that Yitzchak giving this half a shekel um, in, the, in the form of the ring was actually hinting to the future time when all the Jewish people would donate half a shekel for the building of the Mishkan. Um, and the question is, what's the connection and what can we learn from all of this? What's the lesson? Um, and we're told basically that the whole idea, um, oh, and I forgot to add further, like to add to the question, to make the question more of a question, um, is we know that everything that we do for Hashem, all the mitzvot and everything that we do to serve Hashem is meant to be done in the most, you know, complete and beautiful manner. So for example, when it comes to Shabbat, um, we're meant to do the blessing on the challah it's meant to be two whole loaves of challah as opposed to a slice of challah. Um, you know, or let's say the mitzvah of, uh, on Sukkot for an esrog, it needs to be a complete, beautiful esrog, a complete, beautiful lulav. And in general, that's a rule for all the mitzvahs that things should be complete and beautiful. So seemingly, this adds to the question as to why would Hashem specifically ask the Jewish people to donate half a shekel? Because it seems like it's not, the complete most best way of doing the mitzvah it would seem that it would be better if every person gave a whole shekel. That would be the complete most beautiful way of doing the mitzvah. Um, why then does Hashem ask every Jew to give half? And we basically learned that this idea of a half a shekel teaches us something um, really powerful and essential to Judaism, which is how Judaism views marriage and how Judaism views um, our relationship to God, the Jewish people's connection to God. And um, it goes as follows that whereas there's many people who can view the idea of marriage as two separate people um, coming together and uniting. They become one, they unite, but they're still two separate people that found each other and decided that they want to get married and they want to connect and be united. That would be the general view of marriage. Um, whereas Judaism were taught that just like Adam and Eve, they were originally, God created them as one being and then separated them into male and female. The same thing is true of every married couple, that really every, every man and woman really consists of one soul. And um, at the time of birth, God separates half of the soul into a male body and half of the soul into a female body. And you know, until we find each other and get married, each half of the soul lives their life, you know, independently. And eventually God brings them together. God orchestrates that they should find each other and that they're the two halves of the, of each other's soul should be not united, but reunited. So 
it can sound similar, but it's actually a very fundamental, fundamental difference. Instead of um, two becoming one, it's two halves of one becoming one. It's not a union, but it's a reunion. That's how um, Judaism views marriage, that it's really two halves of one soul. So that's the first thing that we learned, the fact that Yitzchak gave Rivka this ring um, with the value of half a shekel shows that he was alluding to this idea that I'm half of a soul, Yitzchak is half, and Rivka is half, that we should always remember this, that we're each half, we need each other, we need, a, we need each other to complement each other, and of course God gave man and woman uh, distinct sets of characteristics and qualities, and it's through uniting and um, joining these qualities that we're truly able to fulfill our mission. Um, and it's actually a very powerful idea because obviously before we get married, we still have um, our divine mission in life, which is you know to do Torah mitzvah and spread God to the world. But once a person gets married and their half of so their soul is reunited with their other half and they become one, um, they actually have a lot more power to fulfill their divine mission once they're together, once they're complete. So on the one hand, of course, Judaism um, tells us that we should give our complete selves to our marriage and devote our whole being to our marriage and, you know, to making our marriage work. And Shalom Bayit, which is peace in the home, is really, really fundamental and essential uh, to Judaism. And there's a lot of things that come in front of that because God really treasures and values the Jewish home and the Jewish marriage and having peace in the home. Um, so at the same time, although we're giving our whole selves into our marriage and devoting ourselves completely, we should always recognize and realize that we're not two separate beings that our whole life are trying to get together and trying to connect and trying to unite, but we're really each a half of one whole, each a half of one soul. And, um, we are essentially one and it's our job to, you know, keep reuniting and to be connected on all levels, of course, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, and to help each other and to strengthen each other and realize that together we're very powerful. When we're one soul, we're able to accomplish a lot more. And how could we, you know, help each other to fulfill each of our divine missions in life and um, do more Torah mitzvot. So that was the marriage aspect of it. And then I mentioned as well that this also will apply to our relationship with God. Um, oftentimes, the Jewish people's relationship to Hashem is compared to marriage. Um, and we're told by when the Jews received the Torah at Mount Sinai, um, that was actually like the marriage um, contract, the marriage document that, um, you know, connected us to God, married us to God, so to say. Um and because of this, we can apply the same rule that we just spoke about with um, a marriage between husband and wife. We can apply that same concept to the marriage of the Jewish people and Hashem, which is that, um, believe it or not, us and Hashem are actually partners. And um, the crazy thing is that this is um, based on a sicha, which is a talk of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, where the Rebbe actually says that we, we are, so to say, um, half of God and God is half of us. Um, which is pretty incredible if you think about it, that we could be like a half to God because God is the creator. God is God is everything. God is way above us. And yet God connected himself so deeply and so intri intrinsically to the Jewish people that we're like God's partner, God's marriage partner um, to um, fix the world, make the world a better place and bring God down to earth and make the world a place of goodness and kindness and godliness, which is every time through us doing Torah mitzvot and spreading God. And last week we spoke about the seven Noahide laws, which is the Jewish people's responsibility um, to teach the non-Jewish nations about these seven Noahide laws, which a lot of a lot of people, or we could say most people, I'm not sure, um, already follow these seven Noahide laws. Uh, but for those who don't, um, I'll run through them quickly. I did last week. It's not to murder, not to steal, um, not to eat, um, eat from an animal while it's alive, which again, I don't know if that happens nowadays, but I, I guess it was more common back in the day. But the general idea of that is not to be cruel to animals, which is why um, animals that are slaughtered by, um, you know, by a shokhet, which is uh, someone who is 
certified according to Kashrut, according to Torah, to slaughter animals, they um, are given very, very strict set of laws from the Torah of where exactly and how exactly to kill animals in a way that would cause the animal the least amount of pain. So the idea is basically no cruelty to animals. Um, I said three. I'm not saying them. I don't, I'm not saying them in a specific order. Another law would be to respect family relationship, not to have immoral relationships, and to stay devoted and loyal to your spouse. Um, that was four. A fifth one would be to set up courts of justice and law and ensure that there's justice uh, in the country and the world. Um, that was five or. Oh, I, that's funny. I missed the two first ones, which are, of course, the most central, um, which is to believe in one God. Even non-Jews have the uh, obligation from Torah to believe that there's one God of the world, one creator in charge of everyone, and all people were created in God's image. And the second one was not to swear in God's name, not to curse uh, God, God forbid. So those were the first two that I said at the end. But um, sorry, I kind of sidetracked it, but I was just repeating what I said last week. Um, that mm, kind of lost my whole train of thought. Okay, now I got it. Basically, it's we're partners with God. God created this whole world and God gave the Torah to the Jewish people and said that us as Jews, it's our responsibility and our uh, mission in life to partner with God, to make the world a good place, to choose good over evil, to do more Torah mitzvah, to bring more light into the world. And that's why I was speaking about the seven Noahide laws, because it's also our responsibility to spread light um, to the non to the non Jews and to, um, you know, bring them the awareness and the recognition that there is one God, one creator of all of us and respecting God, respecting human life, respecting um our relationships, respecting animals, respecting justice. These are all things that are fundamental, fundamental beliefs and laws that all that we want to spread to the whole world because that is the preparation for Mashiach coming. When the whole world can get into a more um, godly state, a more moral state, a more respectful state um, of mind and state of being, um, that's how we usher in Mashiach when um, there will actually be no more bad, no more evil, no more sickness. God will God will make that there will only be good in the world, only holiness. And everyone will truly recognize God in a way that we don't recognize him now. Of course, all Jewish people were told were the sons, uh, were the believers, the son of believers. So Jewish people have within our soul, because we have a piece of God within us, we have a natural inherent belief in God, even though we can't see God. And it could be hard sometimes to believe in and trust in God. Nevertheless, when Mashiach comes, um, our belief in God is going to be to a whole different level because we're actually going to be able to see God and understand God and and um, God is going to be revealed to us in a whole different way. So basically to sum up the whole thing is to basically say that the fact that um, the Jewish people were told by Hashem when they were building the Mishkan, which was the temporary de dwelling in the time of the desert, why God specifically wanted every Jew to give half a shekel was to recognize that every Jew is like a half of God, which means every Jew should realize that we have a real divine mission, a real purpose together with God, partnering with God to make the world a better place and to be the ones to bring God and godliness into the world. Um, and that's what's going to bring Mashiach. And we should have Mashiach right now and only hear of good news. And God should protect all the Jewish people and everybody and protect the land of Israel. And we should really only hear good news. And when Mashiach comes, everything will really fall into a place with only goodness and kindness. Um, that ends the class. But I wanted to um, end off by mentioning that next week, Thursday, my mother-in-law wanted me to remind everyone that there's going to be a challah bake at Chabad. So it's going to be instead of the class at seven o'clock at Chabad. And please spread the word to any of your friends. Uh, mark it down in your in your schedule to make sure you're able to come. It's really going to be a special event. We're, we're going to bake challah in honor of the hostages. So 239 challah challahs in honor of the 239 hostages. And hafrasha challah, which is making the blessing when you separate the challah, 
um, is a unique mitzvah that was given specifically to the woman. And it's a very, very special time to pray. When we take off that piece of challah and we make the blessing, it's a time that um, women have a time to pray to God. And um, it's a really auspicious um, opportunity. Whoever saw, um, it was going around when Ori, um, the Jewish soldier who was freed by the IDF when she was, thank God, released. Um, it was There was a video going around of her mother doing hafrashat khala, I think just two days or three days before. And um, the power of a mother's prayer and the power of doing hafrashat khala, um, that you know her daughter was released and was um, not released, I guess, was <laughs> taken by IDF, but yeah, released by IDF. And uh, yeah, so basically spread the word and it would be amazing to see you all. It's going to be a really special event and God should help us all, all and we should have Mashiach even before that event and we should all be able to return to Israel and have all the blessings and all the goodness in our lives. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Shabbat Shalom. Have a great night and God bless you all. Thank you for joining. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much, Mushki. Wonderful class. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Thank you, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very Shabbat much. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bless. Bye-bye. Bye. The event is basically Shana making Hala. Um, I think it's just going to be making Hala and saying some prayers for the hostages. I think there's going to be dough for everybody. We're all going to be able to separate the Hala and make the blessing for that and honor the hostages to come back. All the best. Shabbat shalom. Good night.